back. If you can fill out one of these little connection cards, if you're a guest for us, that would help us with, with some information. But we're just glad you're here. Glad everybody is uh, here assembled this morning. As we heard in the announcements, a lot of great things going on coming up. Hope you're planning to be a part of those that uh, most apply to you and that you'll support us in those things. So I shared with you a few weeks ago when we started this series, I love the book of Revelation. And this morning we're going to open up the heart of Revelation, some real apocalyptic stuff. There are going to be beasts and blood and monster frogs and all kinds of crazy things. So strap in and hold on because it's about to get real in here. Now remember what we're doing in studying the seven blessings of the apocalypse. Seven times in this wonderful last book of the Bible, John the writer and either, either he or one of the characters in the book sort of steps into the midst of all the craziness and pronounces a blessing, a beatitude, some call them, and pronounces that upon the people of God for something. In chapter 1 and verse 3, it was a blessing for those who read these words and those who hear the, the words, and those who keep them. In chapter 14 and verse 13, it was a blessing on those who die in the Lord. Today we come to chapter 16 of the Apocalypse, and we find a blessing on those who, of all things, keep their clothes on. Now, we'll explain that in a moment, but first, let's, let's get a blessing and read, okay? Chapter 16. Now, uh, the blessing itself is pronounced in verse 15 of the chapter. I thought it would be worthwhile to get a flavor of the whole thing and just read beginning in verse 1 all the way down to where the beatitude comes. But before we do that, let me prepare you a bit because, as I said, this is pretty intense, apocalyptic, and um, we're just going to wade into it. This is the chapter of Revelation where God pours out his final wrath on all his enemies. He does this by sending angels with bowls full of wrath, full up to the brim, full of the wrath or the anger of God. And so an angel will step forward and will dump his bowl upon the earth. And again, this, this bowl is full of God's anger. And then after he dumps it, terrible things happen on the earth. Now remember that these are images. These are symbols it's a powerful vision that's given to John to explain ultimate things. How, in the end, God is going to defeat all those who oppose him. And how, in the end, God's people will be victorious. Even though at the moment it doesn't look like they will be. So it doesn't mean, literally, that there's going to come a day when an angel dumps bowl uh, upon the earth. What it means is that, that God is all-powerful, and it means that we, his people, really ought to trust him. And, and we ought to remain faithful to him no matter what is going on in this lost and dying world. No matter what we're experiencing here, we ought to trust and be faithful to him. So Revelation, this book, is, is a, a figurative, moving word picture designed to make an impression 
to grab your attention, and it never fails to do that. So let's hear it this morning. Revelation chapter 16, verse 1, beginning. John writes, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse. And every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, trust, tr true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophets, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now our purpose is not to go through this and explain all the signs and symbols and exactly what they mean and, and exactly what they refer to. And even if I did, I would be pretending because I don't know. Beware of anybody who says they do. That is my advice to you. Beware of anybody who says they can explain every sign and every symbol. I reiterate the purpose of this, the purpose of this style of writing, apocalyptic it's called, is to make an impression. Let's see if it did. Would you say in this chapter that God is angry? It sounds like God's angry, doesn't it? I agree. Would you say that God means business? I agree. Would you say from this that there are some really bad people or forces in the world? Yep, it sure sounds like it. Would you say that those people's days are numbered? Absolutely. Well, message received. 
impression made. You see, you got it. See, Revelation ain't that hard, is it? English grammar might be, but Revelation is, is not that difficult when you understand the purpose and what it's supposed to express. Okay, so right in the midst of this picture of God's final judgment on his enemies and all the turmoil and all the tumult on, and so forth, we have these words of blessing. And it starts with this. The Lord says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Now this is, is not the first time that we have heard this uh, from the Lord in uh, Scripture or, or from his apostles. If you're familiar with the New Testament, it's not the first time we've heard this kind of phrase. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, Jesus said the following. I quote, I'm quoting him here. He said, but know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Jesus played on some common sense there, didn't he? Anybody ever robbed you but warned you first? Invaded your house but told you they were going to do it first? No, because you would be prepared. Jesus says, I'm coming like a thief. Both the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter learn this from the Lord, and they, they repeat it in, in, in a different way. Paul, in 1 Thessalonians 5, writes the following. He says, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. And then also Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, says the following. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Now, it might make us a bit uncomfortable to associate Jesus with a thief. But he's the one who did it first. If you think about it, he's the one who first used that comparison. So, so what does it mean? He will come like a thief, like a thief in the night. Of course, it means that he will come suddenly. He will come without warning. There's not going to be a five-minute warning or a, a two-month warning. All right, he will come without warning. He will come unexpectedly when he comes. It's a travesty, you see, that so many people down through the centuries have tried to use this very book, the book of Revelation, to try and predict when Jesus would come. When in this very book, he says, Behold, I will come like a thief, without warning, suddenly, when no one expects it, that's when he's coming. Again, beware of anybody that tells you they've got that figured out when he's coming. We don't. The nature of the second coming of Christ is sudden and unexpected. If you're told differently, whoever tells you has an agenda and has a problem with the truth. Indeed, Jesus could return before I finish speaking this morning. 
Are you ready for that? He could return in 5,000 years. And I'm not going to argue with him either way, are you? It's up to him. See? So if that's the nature of Jesus' coming, sudden, unexpected, it makes total sense what the Lord says next in the text. He says, blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and exposed. The third blessing of the apocalypse. How do we translate that blessing? I think in this way. Blessed is the one who stays ready for Jesus' return. Blessed is he or she who stays ready. If we don't know when he's coming, if we can't know when, if it's going to happen suddenly, then for Pete's sake, we need to stay ready, as my dad would say. We need to stay ready. No messing around, you see. None of this, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play around with sin for a season, and then I'll get straightened up before the Lord returns. You don't know when he's coming. You need to stay ready. Keep awake. No flirting with the world. You know, one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. That doesn't work. That just means really that you have both feet in the world. And I know I'll obey the gospel. I'll be baptized one day. I'll do that one day. If you know what you need to do to get into Christ, you need to do it today, right now. Because the Lord could come before the sun sets. Or even before you get to lunch. His coming is sudden. So obedience is urgent. It is a matter of eternal life. Or eternal death, my friend. Then Jesus underlines it and emphasizes it by saying, in effect, blessed is the one who keeps his clothes on and doesn't walk around naked. What in the world does that mean? Well, he's, he's really not addressing modest clothing as, uh, as we approach warmer weather and summer months. It's not uh, the purpose of his message, although that is a valid scriptural message. That's not what's being said here. What is? You know, two of the most important words in the New Testament are in Christ. In Christ. So the scripture says, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. That's Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Clothed with Christ, you see. And then also Romans 13, verse 14. The word of God says, Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. See, being clothed with Christ is, is one way the Bible describes both gospel obedience and faithful living thereafter. Being clothed with Christ. So Jesus says in this blessing in Revelation 16, in light of the fact that this world is passing away and judgment is coming, and I'm coming suddenly and without warning. Stay awake. Keep yourself ready. And keep your clothes on. 
Don't buy the lies and the propaganda being spewed out by the powerful in this world. You know those crazy frogs in the passage? I think one way to understand what they picture is propagandists, world propagandists, and the world is full of them today, and a lot of them look like frogs, frankly. They're gross, they're slimy, and they, they make an awful sound. Don't buy their lies. It's actually their death throes. Ride out the storm of this world. Stay faithful when the going gets tough, and it's going to be tough. But as Jesus said one time to his original 12 apostles, right before they were about to go through their great storm of life, John chapter 16, verse 33, he said to them, I, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeps his garments on. The third blessing of the apocalypse. I ask you this morning in closing, if you got your clothes on, are you clothed with Christ? Have you done those things that, that we quoted this morning from the Word of God to get in Christ? And if you have, have you kept your clothes on? Are you ready for his return? It could come before we sing, while we sing, or it might be generations ahead. But we ask you to think about your relationship with the Lord this morning versus your relationship with this world. And who are you following? If you need to make a change, we invite you to do so. Let us know about it while we stand and sing this song.